Attention shoppers! Tonight on The Checkout, Zoe looks at which pet foods are best in chow, Kirsten rents a car and gets taken for a ride, and Ben asks, if you get a dodgy invoice, can you make the company pay? Somewhere. Unfortunately, they're too bulky to pack in a suitcase, so sometimes you have to hire one. Well, you don't have to. I will be on my way. But if you do hire a car, the advertised rate can be hard to get. Oh, that's only if you get the compact. For a minimum of seven days. And you can only drive it in reverse. And that's because there are a lot of extra charges. There's an administration fee, a vehicle registration recovery fee, a premium location surcharge, taxes, and a credit card fee. Nothing like the feeling of the wind in your hair. Now, sometimes those charges are for optional extras, like $21 a day to hire a booster seat. It comes with a free kid. Or $15 a day to hire a GPS. Or $300 to drive one way. Hey, it costs us a lot to get those cars back to Adelaide. But some charges, like administration and vehicle registration recovery fees, or the premium location surcharge charged at airports and city depots, almost always apply. So why don't they just fold those extra charges into the basic rate? Well, Thrifty said... We believe in complete transparency and our customers having a full breakdown of all costs pertaining to their rental. It certainly is transparent, in the sense that you can see straight through it. I'm just glad all companies aren't so transparent. All right, that's $1.50 for the coffee, 90 cents for the milk, 80 cents for the latte art, 30 cents rustic decor surcharge, and of course, we are a premium location. Another reason for all of this transparency is because of their special offers. Rent five days and save 15% off the base rate. Get $20 off the daily base rate. Receive two days free of the daily base rate. So your discount only applies to the daily, daily base, base rate. rate. Not the taxes, fees, charges and optional extras that can make up the bulk of your bill. Which is a bit like doing this. 50% off M&M's. Discount only applies to pink M&M's. So don't assume a low base rate or a special offer means you're getting a good deal. It's tedious, but comparing complete quotes from different companies is your best bet. And while you're at it, pay extra attention to the insurance hazards. It's often not until you're picking up the keys that you find out what the standard level of insurance means. If you make a claim, you'll pay $2,850 excess, $3,017 excess. $3,800 excess, $4,000 excess. And that's why we upsell you excess reduction. Only $30 a day. But that's more than the actual car costs. It's your call. And even the most expensive cover often comes with a long list of exceptions, like hail damage, fire damage, storm damage, cyclone damage, driving through floodwaters, single vehicle accidents, lost key replacement, and driving on unsealed roads. Also, damage to the windscreen and undercarriage, roof or tyres. Hey. Anytime you break a road rule or any law, and driving outside town limits in Western Australia or the Northern Territory between dusk and dawn. So what am I actually paying for? Peace of mind.
But remember, fine print in the contract can't override your consumer law protections. There's even a landmark court case to prove it, and it stars Bruce Lee. They call me Bruce. A New Zealand tourist whose rental car was damaged in an accident in Brisbane. They call me Bruce Boo. He got angry when the car rental company charged him 50 grand for damages, despite having previously told him he'd bought the most comprehensive insurance available. The very best. So Bruce took the contract to the federal court and they were <laughs> unimpressed. So what do you think? Your father was unconscionable. And what else? East Coast is liable to pay. Which made Bruce Lee jump for joy. Or whatever that is. This movie's awful. Get out! <sighs> there are alternatives to buying your insurance from the car hire companies. There are? Ugh. Yep, you can buy domestic travel insurance or car hire excess insurance from other companies. These policies can be one-fifth the price of the major car hire companies. And they usually cover most things in that long list of exceptions. Keep in mind that if you do have an accident, you'll need to pay the car rental company, then claim that amount back through your external insurer. So you might find yourself out of pocket for a while. Damage disputes. Many consumers complain about having to pay for damage that didn't actually happen. That's a scratch. And dodgy repair charges. Thousand dollars. That's a scratch. <laughs> In one case, Europe Car was ordered to repay the $814 they charged a customer's credit card for a dent in the roof without providing any evidence of the damage. And in 2013, a Tasmanian car hire business was fined almost a quarter of a million dollars after it was found to be charging customers more than three times the cost of repairs. Worst of all, car hire companies charge their premium location surcharge as a percentage of the total bill, including damages. Wait. The ACCC is currently taking Europe Car to court over some of these fees. But in the meantime, it's a good idea to thoroughly inspect a vehicle before you hire it and take photographs before and after you return it. Choice even recommends you try to get the sales assistant in the photos. Duck face. Do a duck face. To avoid paying the premium location surcharge, consider making your own way to a non-premium car hire office. Public transport or even a taxi could work out cheaper. If you're likely to be using toll roads, ask about your e-tag options. And keep in mind that some companies also charge a hefty toll processing admin fee. Fuel up yourself if you can, otherwise you'll be slugged a premium fuel rate on the refill. I refuel for free with my own hearty effort. There's one more piece of advice when it comes to hiring a car. Consider not hiring one at all. Ho oh, ho, I knew you'd come around. No, mate. Oh, boo. There are car sharing services in most capital cities now. Their standard rates normally include insurance with lower excesses and fewer exclusions. They could save you a bit of money and a lot of hassle. Wait! I need a new daycare plan. $999,999,999 and pay $14.63 per bag. But I only wanted 999999998 of them. Everything must go. Sale. Sale items not included. Work in progress. Complete scaffold solution. Danger. Scaffold incomplete. You had one job, you complete <laughs> 
Crusader's delight. Timmy's dog tent. 20 by 20 by 20 centimetres. Extra roomy. Yeah, if you're a tub of yoghurt. <laughs> the ideal gift. Kills head lice by suffocation. That's the one for Mum. Sorry, Mum, but you've got head lice. <sighs> Join us next time for more Signs of the Time or we'll kill your head lice. <laughs> we take you now to the 2015 Best in Chow Pet Food Show. In Australia, we own a lot of pets, spending around $3 billion a year on their slop. From the basic to the extravagant to this bag of pig snouts. The range out there is almost as vast and varied as our furry friends themselves. <laughs> There's just one area where our pets are getting a bit... samey. You're all fat. Like, crazy fat. Oh no, my self-esteem. Down it goes. So should we be feeding our furry friends stuff like Hill's Prescription Diet, Feline Weight Loss, Low Carbohydrate, Glucose Management? Or is it all a steaming pile of animal byproduct mush and mystery stink juice? Let's meet our first judge, Pafia, or the Pet Food Industry Association of Australia. Pafia members make 98% of pet food sold in Australia, and it is the proud custodian of the pet food industry standard. They not only help develop the rules on pet food labelling, they also regulate them. But Pafia is kind of relaxed. Totally chill. Like in our first category of best in chow, meat. Gourmet beef, grilled chicken, real chicken, tuna salmon soulmates. This is an excellent source of protein. My favourite is protein. The standards say that if a dry food product is named after a type of meat, like beef, the product only needs to contain 20% meat and only 25% of that meat has to be beef, so long as there is more beef than any other type of meat, which means that your beef could be only 5% beef. I've got no beef with that. That's the point. When it comes to wet food, if you want to call it beef, 25% of the meat content has to be beef, and beef has to be the main meat, but there is no minimum percentage for that total meat content. So all we can safely say about this beef pet food is that beef counts for 25% of an unknown fraction of the product. What do you have to say about that, Pafia? <laughs> Embrace the mystery. Next up, we have the qualifying round. Because some words qualify a product to have even less meat in it. Like the word dinner. Or in fact, any of these words. Tender chicken dinner. Savoury seafood entree. Ocean fish platter. Kitten whitefish feast. Labelling your pet food beef dinner has the same requirements as labelling it beef, only beef doesn't even have to be the main meat ingredient. <gasps> So if the guidelines are anything to go by, this beef dinner is not a beef dinner. What a dog's breakfast! In the bad figurative way, not in the eating way that I like. Another big qualifier is the word with. With Angus beef capsicum and green beans. With beef mince. With chicken and veal casserole. A dry product with beef only has to have as little as 5% beef, but does not need to have any other meat whatsoever. And it can also have higher quantities of other meat not mentioned in the name of the product. So this dog food with beef could be 5% beef and 15% chicken, or it could be 5% beef and 95% rice. Yes! Rice is carb loading! Yes! So 5% doesn't sound like a lot of meat, but it is better than the guidelines for wet food, where there is no specified limit to how little meat it can have. Where's the beef? Now, these two beneficial products, Healthy Weight with Chicken and Complete Health with Beef, could have exactly the same ingredients. We don't know if they do, but the vague list of ingredients on both of them are identical. So, if two packets with different names can have the same lists of ingredients, how is that accurate and not misleading like the PAFIA guidelines should ensure? This is really one for our other judge, philosopher Rene Descat. I don't think, therefore I am kept. Thank you, Rene. And at the end of the qualifying round, 
everyone qualifies, <laughs> thanks to the needlessly complicated and yet perplexingly relaxed guidelines. What about halal pet food? Shut up, Cat Stevens. So we now know that Pathia doesn't require meaty products to have very much meat in them. But what does meat even mean? Let's find out in our next round, Meat Byproducts. <laughs> Firstly, when it comes to horse meat, Pathia say... <laughs> That's right. They say no to horse, dolphin or whale meat. No whale meat? Excellent choice. Boo! But things get a little laxer from there. According to Pathia, meat could mean any part of the animal that includes protein, which could include blood or entrails. Hey, I'm a cat. I'll eat anything. But if a product says it includes byproducts, that could include parts of the animal that don't even contain protein. Boo! An absence of protein is my least favourite! <laughs> what about beaks? Who knows? The guidelines don't define byproducts at all. Oh no! The beaks! So we know this is gross, but is it bad? Let's ask animal nutritionist Dr. Wendy Brown, spokes cat. Folks, cat, are byproducts bad or just disgusting? Byproducts are generally lower quality and the nutrients are harder for the animal to digest, such as bone, fatty tissue, and blood. Thanks, Spokes Cat. I'm gonna vomit. And now a message from our sponsors. Intense beauty and age-defying to fight the four signs of aging. Pet food that thinks it's a skin cream. Next up, our sponsor's favorite round. Vague claims. Isle of Dogs Natural Chill Out. Science Diet Hairball Control Light. Kitten Wholesome Essentials Chicken. Like this Hills Kitten Healthy Development Original, which claims to help build immunity and digestive health. We asked Hills how this product promotes healthy development in kittens, as well as building immunity and digestive health, and they told us that it contains gentle fibres. Spokes Cat. What is a gentle fibre? There is no such thing. Your pets don't need magical food ingredients. They just need a balanced diet and plenty of exercise. But Hills aren't alone. There are a lot of words that appear on pet food labels that are basically meaningless, like science or diet or prescription. Oh wait, they're all Hills. But it really is a tight race to the bottom with Vetalogica's daily tranquil treats using something they made up called Karmafan technology to help maintain emotional balance in dogs. It's also called a daily treat. And the word treat in the guidelines means... Not nutritionally complete. So, Spokescat, how often should we feed our animals treats? Rarely. What about daily treats? Rarely. Same goes for words like snack, complimentary and supplement, like these tuna slices in light jus. Even though they're called a meal, they're actually intended for occasional use. Twelve? Mmm. I guess jus is French for gelling agents. Same goes for dine succulent chicken breast. If you want a proper nutritious meal for your pet, avoid words like treat, supplemental and occasional. But if you want to buy a product that has everything your special friend actually needs, just look for nutritionally complete and balanced on the label. That means it has all the normal nutritional requirements for a healthy pet. But if I only eat complete and balanced food, then why am I still fat? Spokes cat? Animal obesity is largely a problem of overfeeding. Ooh. It's the humans' fault! Kill all the humans! That's for making me fat, Janet! This week on Please Stop Writing It About This. Unfortunately, Darren the Park doesn't legally have to guarantee any specific amount of wetness or wildness during your visit. Hello. Each week on The Checkout, we get sent hundreds of letters, emails and the occasional gift from a secret admirer. Ooh. <laughs> but many of you have been asking about bag searches in shops. What rights does the consumer have in refusing a bag search or any other search? Thanks. Catherine? No problem. Well, it's true that according to these guidelines, retailers can set conditions of entry for their stores. So, if they're clearly displaying a sign like this, then they have the right to ask you to open your bag for a search. If you refuse, they can ask you to leave the shop and not return. The guidelines say there should be no direct physical contact with the customer's bag or person. Can't touch this. Can't touch this. 
regardless of signage, people caught in the act of shoplifting can be forcibly restrained, although they can't be assaulted. The shopkeeper can also call the police, but they can't assault you either. Look, no one can assault anyone, OK? Oh, there are a few other details, though. You can be asked to move items inside your bag that may obstruct their search. And it's not only bags that can be checked. Other items that might reasonably conceal goods, like cartons, parcels or overcoats. The guidelines say standard-sized handbags, around the size of an A4 sheet of paper or smaller, should be exempt from searching. Unless the store employee is certain you've shoplifted. If you've been detained when you haven't done anything wrong, you can complain to store management or the police. You can also ask the Privacy Commissioner to take action on your behalf, although they can't assault anyone either. So, that's the story. Stores are allowed to make bag inspections a clear condition of entry. You can't be assaulted, and if you're detained unfairly, you can complain. So please, stop, stop writing in about, about this! Hello, and welcome to F YouTube, the segment that you are watching right now. First up, snacks. Here's Stuart, who describes himself as... A fairly frequent eater of Arnott's shapes. Hey, who isn't? They combine all the fun of salt with the thrill of being a shape. Over the years, been a pretty frequent eater of these, and also of these. Whoa! Shapes extreme? Those must be some pretty out there shapes. It's a hexagon! There's a brisket in the shape of a hexagon! A brisket! <laughs> Ambulance, please. Now, shapes are the best way of keeping in shape, which is why Stuart was so excited when he saw... Shapes light and crispy. With... 75% less saturated fat. Asterisk. Being a checkout viewer, though, Stuart decided to look into this claim. And what I found was that this actually only has about 20% less saturated fat. Than these. Hmm. And he's right. Compared to shape sensations, it's only a reduction of about 20%, and it's only 17% less if you compare it to shapes extreme. 17%? <laughs> so, what is the comparison here? Stuart? These are 75% less saturated fat than potato chips cooked in palm oil. Ah, so that's not in comparison to any other kind of shapes, or for that matter, any of these chips. Whoa, that is one powerful asterisk. So using that technique, could a company compare their product to anything they want? Ooh, 6,000% healthier than being stabbed. Ugh, should've got the shapes. No. According to ACCC Chairman Rod Sims... The inclusion of an asterisk does not remove the potential to be misleading. Hey, I'd have read that line if you'd asked me to. Sorry, Rod. No problem. So, Stuart, if you think shapes are being misleading here, you can take that up with your state or territory fair trading department. And if you do, probably also check out what other dubious claims Arnott's is making. Tiny? Tiny compared to what? The moon? <laughs> and if you've come across some especially powerful asterisks, then why not send them here for your chance to win a prize? But what does that asterisk mean? Wait, it means like win an asterisk? Like an asterisk is the prize? Okay. Next up, Mariana, who very wisely got a property inspection before buying, because you can never be too careful. You show me where it says that that house wasn't full of bees. And so, before purchasing her apartment, Mariana decided to hire this company. Our reports are the most thorough in the industry and cover every aspect of the property exposed to view. That sounds good, but... When I had moved in, I noticed that the light switch in the bathroom wasn't working. That's a bit annoying, especially when... On page 18 it said, light switch in bathroom in working order. So, Mariana emailed them about the switch. I've noticed the switch in the bathroom doesn't work. And ended by saying... I'm a bit disappointed. And she said this because... I was a bit disappointed. Now, this isn't a story about whether pre-purchase inspections have to look at light switches. 
In fact, even Mariana agrees that the light switch could have been broken after the inspection. This is bullshit! No, this is about what happened next, because... I received a very interesting reply. Yeah, interesting is one word for it. And look, for the sake of balance, we are going to try and put this email in the best possible light by having it read by the famously lovely Miff Warhurst. It is unfortunate that you have not read the building report provided to you since you are about to incur substantial costs that will dwarf the disappointment you feel about the light switch in the bathroom. Hang on. This is really mean. You think that was mean? They also attached an invoice for $1,287 and this. Should our invoice not be paid within seven days of the date of this email, we will take the necessary legal action to recover our costs. So wait, they charged her over $1,000 for complaining? Well, they said it was $792 to upload the report from the archives and provide the response, and $495 for their manager to review the email and the response. That's a f***ing load of shit. Isn't she lovely? Anyway, when Mariana responded in understandable confusion, they replied... Now, oh, we've lost me. But basically, their replies were different variations on get a lawyer. So, what's going on here? Can a company just invoice you for a service that you didn't ask for? Because if they can, that's a pretty sweet business model. Your invoice, ma'am. This is a $400 invoice for eating a peach. I didn't ask you to do that. And you haven't even finished it yet. I'm getting to it. In fact, the Australian consumer law is pretty clear on this. It says that asserting a right to payment for unsolicited services is illegal. And in Mariana's case, we reckon this is pretty cut and dry. She didn't solicit services, she just said she was a bit disappointed. And it's hard to imagine that anyone could reasonably believe that the company had a right to invoice for over $1,200 for replying to an email. Yeah, I mean, that's nuts. The consumer law also says that it's illegal to harass or coerce people for payment. Now, we need to be a little bit careful here because it seems that if there's one thing that New South Wales pre-purchase inspections loves more than inspecting things in New South Wales pre-purchase, it's threatening to sue people. But we reckon that's what's happened to Mariana. Now, we put these questions to New South Wales pre-purchase inspections and they replied... We have received your email, but we will not be responding. Ha! Joke's on you, idiots. You just did. But honestly, we are glad they didn't take much time to properly respond. The ABC just simply wouldn't have been able to afford it. Until next week, good night.